All right, Uma Faikin. Uh In this video, I want to talk about something that um, for some time has been um, dear to me, a subject that uh, has been dear to me. Uh, and it's, um, it's one that I think some people may have thought uh, we forgot about or, or we kind of pushed to the side. Um, recently, I've talked about the fact that we are a combative uh, channel. Um, we got pigeonholed in, into uh, being a boxing channel because I box. I boxed for some time, uh, have some knowledge of, of boxing, uh, old school boxing, teach boxing. Uh, and the questions came about boxing. So uh, I would ask, answer one question after another, after another, after another on boxing. This gave the impression that we were solely a boxing channel. It gave the impression to some people that we were solely a boxing channel. Uh, because of the amount of martial arts I've done, and to the degree that I've done them, then yes, I can speak in, from an advanced point of view uh, in regards to a lot of martial arts. But based on my personal uh, life, uh, my personal, exper personal experiences, I have to say that I'm more interested in self-protection, real self-protection. Uh, I'm interested in how the world is. I study violence. I study the mind of people who are violent. I uh, study through neuroscience um, uh, and other um, other methods uh, what makes one a killer, a cold-blooded killer. Uh, not so I would make myself a killer or make someone else a killer, but how to understand um, people when they are violent, uh, things you can do, things you can't do. Um, when it gets to a point where you have to have some kind of preemptive uh, activity uh, and things of that nature. So uh, self-protection is what I primarily study. It is what I primarily teach uh, in our center, uh, self-protection. Private lessons, then people come and they may learn wrestling and they boxing and kickboxing. Um, MMA, but it is a combative center, a self-protection center. That's essentially what it is. Um, now, I've told people in the past that karate is my base. Karate is my base. Now, the thing about karate is it has been, become a laughing stock uh, amongst martial artists, especially since the uh, popularity of MMA. And largely the spokespeople are people who actually should not be talking about karate, at least in the United States. They really should not be talking about it. And the reason is because they don't have any experience in real karate, right? They don't have any experience in it. So I mentioned the idea that Joe Rogan it talks about Taekwondo. And I've pointed out, Joe Hayes, Mike Warren, Albert Cheeks, these people won, uh, represented the United States in 1973 in Seoul, Korea, uh, and brought home the silver medal. Uh, and there are many people who believe they even beat the Koreans, but they were robbed because of where they were. And the Koreans ultimately got the gold medal. Now, Joe Hayes was famous for bare-knuckle fighting, and his favorite technique was reverse punches to the head. This is Taekwondo. Taekwondo has punches to the head. And um, I've often said that if someone hasn't trained in that kind of karate, uh, I don't mean maliciously going off on your dojo mates, but if someone hasn't trained in that kind of karate, then they should not be talking about karate. Karate, to me, is one of the most, if not the most devastating martial art. Now, now hear me out. What other martial art do you know on a regular has black belts who can throw bricks up and break bricks with a reverse punch, with one punch. How many? Now, for those of you who think that's a small thing, try getting Gennady Ganufkin, for example, to throw up a brick and punch it with a boxing punch. Try even maybe getting a heavyweight like Mike Tyson to throw up a bit in his heyday, a brick, and punching it. Many boxers who are even hard punchers are known to have brittle hands. Why? Because even though they're boxing, their arms, their hands aren't conditioned. There's a difference between having conditioned hands, like a karateka, like a real karateka, right? 
who breaks, practices Tamashiwari, the art of breaking, and being a boxer. There's a difference. Most boxers do not have developed hands. They don't have developed hands. Now, they can do it, but they would have to take methods like people like me have taken when we trained in karate to actually toughen your hands, to deaden certain nerves, to get used to certain pain, to get used to trauma in the hands. Now, the fact of the matter is that when I look at my peers, most of my peers are from the UK. Most of my peers are from overseas. And why? Because you look at most of my peers who are combative teachers. Um, their base is karate. Their base is karate. And they will openly say that. My base is karate. Some of the most famous people have said, my base is karate. People like Jeff Thompson, Al Peasland have said, my base is karate. At my heart, I am a karateka. And I've taken karate and I've applied the spirit of hardcore karate, right, to what I do. Now, if you take the United States, and hold on, I'm going to give you my paradigm, because my paradigm, my way of thinking of karate comes from two instructors that I've had. And you will see how when I give you those two paradigms, why my opinion of karate is so much different than other people's opinions of karate. All right? Because it's the paradigm that we're talking about here. It's how we look at things. The paradigm, how we look at things. The, the set of uh, mental rules or the mental protocol that we have that tends to uh, influence most, that influence most our decisions, our likes, our dislikes, our aversions to certain things, our desires for other things. All right? It's our paradigm, the way of seeing things. And my way of seeing karate is based on my teachers. The way of you seeing certain things in life is based on those people who most influence you. That's how the paradigm is basically formed. Unfortunately, many times the paradigm is formed by people who influence us but are incorrect in their opinions. And then you end up being a flawed individual by virtue of the flawed individuals who you took after or copied after. Not genetically, but ideologically and philosophically. So, now, when we understand this, right, I'm going to point out my paradigms for karate, and then your paradigms of karate, where my opinion comes from, and then you'll understand. So if we look at some of the most devastating techniques ever done, devastating, breaking 13 slabs of ice, 9 slabs of ice, 9 boards, find me people in any other martial art any other martial art that actually can develop, that can use that kind of power or generate that kind of power on a regular basis. Now understand this. It's not about one YouTube video, right, of a Muay Thai fighter doing something. It's not about one YouTube video of a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy doing something or a Judo guy doing something or a boxer guy doing something. I am telling you that it is not very hard at all to find a top-notch black belt who can break, who can break maybe what? Four inches, four inches of cement with one punch. I know someone personally who can break two inches, a two inch cement slab, a two inch cement slab, a patio block, something you put on a patio, something that is designed for wear and tear, designed to take punishment from people 200, 300 uh, pounds, right? who can break it with one finger. And I don't mean those people who have four fingers and they act like they're breaking with one, but they're actually breaking with four. I mean, he pulls back three fingers, tucks the thumb in, and breaks it with his left right hand and breaks it with his left hand. A cement, a cement slab, two inches thick. Two inches thick with his fingers. I know, I know him. See him. Got his number. Right? It would be very hard-pressed to find any martial art that generates that kind of power. But because of sport karate, because it has become more like tag, and also because people like Joe Rogan and other people have gone on to many of these schools in the beautiful areas of, their, of, their, of cities where they, where they live, the most air conditioning, the air conditioning, the beautiful pads on the floor. Well, when you live in a high rent or when you rent in a high rent district, well, then it's very important for you to keep the lights on. Now, how do you keep the lights on? Can you keep the lights on teaching people who are lazy? Teaching people who are, you know, take pride in kind of just sitting back and chilling? Can you teach people then the real martial arts? No. No. 
So in order to pay for those rents, you have to water down karate. They say Taekwondo was watered down for people like Joe Rogan. And Taekwondo was watered down for many people who right now are doing Taekwondo and think they're deadly. Right? And it amounts to little more than just jumping around, throwing fancy kicks that wouldn't work and hardly ever hit the target. Right? So, the bottom line is, look at it. Look at it. Today, let's look at some of the most famous techniques that people use. Right? They use the axe hand. The axe hand is a very famous technique that combatives use. The axe hand. Well, the axe hand is nothing more than a chop. It's that same karate chop that people just laughed at, that James Sean Connery used to do in, James, in his James Bond movies. Aha! And people used to laugh. Well, that's the axe hand. And it's considered to be one of the most devastating techniques in martial arts or in fighting arts. Right? Let's look at a concept called the fence. The fence is a concept where you're here, and it's based on keeping your distance, a certain amount of control that you have over, the, over a potential adversary. Well, if you look at this, and most people haven't said this, if you look at this, what is this? This is almost a perfectly inverted karate stance. That's what it is. It's a perfectly inverted karate stance. In fact, in many, in, in many instances, this is how I would fight. I might ball my hand, but I might open my hand and this with this. This is this is what it was. It's passive, offensive, passive, offensive. If we look at the drop step, the drop step that Jack Dempsey talked about when it comes to boxing, where you can't see my feet, but you actually drop your foot down, almost a stomp, and you punch. Bang. Bang. Right? Well, Karate has been throwing reverse punches like that. If you look at any karate to throw a reverse punch, that's what he's doing. He's standing, I'm a southpaw naturally, he's standing this way, and he punches. Bang! Bang! It's a drop step. That's all it is, a drop step. So all these major concepts were being done in hardcore karate. In real karate. And it was being done at least up until the early 1970s. At least. And even later, even later in the UK. I showed you people like Elwin Hall. I showed you people like Frank Brennan. If you get these people and you actually put them up against another fighter of any martial art with their technique and with their power, you might really have your cranium cracked. Because their idea of karate, their paradigm of karate came from their teachers and, 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 and Kanazuki Anoida. Um, these hardcore, uh, hardcore Shotokan teacher in the UK. And this is why in the UK, you have so many people who say that karate is their base. Now, if you look at the gangsters, the gangsters in the UK, the gangsters past and the present in the UK, they generally had two different disciplines. Other than carrying a gun and maybe an ice pick and a knife, they generally had two disciplines, two disciplines that actually made them formidable before they even became gangsters. Okay? There were two disciplines in the UK, the most famous gangsters, right? There was boxing, and then there was karate. Boxing and karate. Check it out. And usually that karate would be Shotokan, traditional, hard-style Japanese karate. They would just take some of the techniques in karate, maybe the, uh, uh, a Shutohuki block, and they would just change it and block this way. You would throw a punch, you would throw a hook, and they would put up their hands. To this day, we see Krav Maga may block like that. We see certain combative methods may block like that. You throw a punch and they move in. Pushing in, punch, elbow, whatever, headbutt. Okay? So we see this, bite. Right? We see all that, right? But essentially, what is this? This is a karate block. It's been in karate for 100, 200 years. So my paradigm is actually hardcore karate. And every single thing I do, everything I do, is based on the concept of Ichigeki Hizatsu. One punch, one kill. Now it doesn't mean that you believe you will kill someone with one punch, or one kick, or one headbutt. But it does mean that that is your goal. 
It doesn't mean that you hit someone and you admire your work. No. It means that you hit that person, hit that person, hit that person, hit them again and again and again and again. We're only talking about in a self-protection, life or death situation. We're not talking about necessarily in sport. We're not talking about if you have to use some kind of control and restraint uh, technique. But we are talking about if someone is going to assail you and you know this, and your life, your health is on the line, then yes, and you must pre throw a preemptive technique, use a preemptive strike of some kind, a preemptive throw, or whatever the case might be, or spit, or whatever, or throw some dirt in their face, hit them with a newspaper, uh, whatever. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the idea is one time you want to do it. One time. You want one time to be the most devastating and devastating enough to stop that threat. That is the idea of Ichigeki Hizatsu, which actually comes from karate. It is called, in the, in the, in the English language, it is referred to as a suicide attack. But it's really not really, doesn't really do it justice. Actually, what Ichigeki Hizatsu actually is, is attacking with such conviction that you totally disregard an opponent's potential counterattack. Okay? You are attacking with such conviction that you disregard what may be coming back. And that conviction, you are attacking with that conviction to render that threat helpless. To render that threat incapable of attacking. And also incapable of, def incapable of defending themselves. So Ichigeki Izatsu is the belief, the philosophy of going all out with every single thing you throw. I bring that element to my boxing. I bring that element to wrestling. If someone comes in and they getting caught underneath of a sprawl, I will show them why they're getting caught underneath of a sprawl. They are not shooting with conviction. They're not shooting deep, not penetrating deep, and shooting with conviction. When they get ready to shoot, there is something that second guesses their shot. And the shot remains too shallow. They are shooting too far out. And the old adage amongst wrestlers is if you can't put your hands on your opponent, then you're too far out to shoot for a takedown. Every single thing I do is based on the philosophy of hardcore budo killing karate, which is called Ichigeki Hizatsu. All right? An all-out attack designed to render the person in front of you incapable of mounting a defense or an offense. Now, if we look at my paradigm, what is my paradigm? My paradigm, as I promised you, it comes from two instructors. I've had two primarily, primary instructors, okay? One of them, one of them was a full teacher of full contact bare knuckle fighters. You recall me saying in 1975 that there was a full contact karate tournament in Harlem, New York. Two of those, two of the division winners came from that particular teacher's school. Okay, Naseba T. Hill's instructor, who happens to be her uncle also. The lightweight champion was taught by this man. The heavyweight champion was also taught by that man. In a full contact, bare knuckle, everything goes. You can even punch and kick to the groin. The only thing you couldn't do was uh, attack the eyes, and that was done in a few times, and nobody really got disqualified. It was a warning, but they kept fighting. So even that really was allowed in retrospect, all right? Now... This gentleman also was known to referee underground death matches. Now, these match matches were not necessarily to the death. They actually went, uh, these matches went until one man could not continue. He was famous for refereeing those blood matches in the 70s. When he had a confrontation, I'm not saying it was right, but he once had a confrontation with a man and literally took his eye out with a karate technique with a karate technique, took his eye out. Was he wrong for doing it? Yes. Was he too temperamental in his day? Yes. But the fact of the matter is, using a karate technique, he removed a man's eye. So now we have a man who was world famous for training full contact, bare knuckle fighters. We have a man who was a chief referee in blood matches and undercover underground blood matches, uh, death matches of, of sorts. We had a man who in real fights, would damage opponents to the point of one taking one's man eye out, one man's eye out. Well, he was one, one of my teachers. So my paradigm comes from him it, to a certain extent as one of my teachers and the kind of karate he taught, kind of karate he did. Another one who taught me uh, was in that same full contact bare knuckle fight in 1975, 
uh, was a man who won the middleweight title. He won. Didn't teach the people. He won. He fought. Won the middleweight title. He's another one of my, uh, my inspirations where I get my idea from karate, my paradigm of karate. He was another one of my teachers. Now, this particular gentleman uh, was so respected as a full contact, bare knuckle karate fighter, so respected. He was so vaunted. He was so feared on a tournament circuit that a gentleman saw him and asked him if he wanted a job. And actually, he ended up, this fighter, one of my karate teachers, ended up being a bodyguard for a woman by the name of Diana Ross. Now, most of you are too young to even remember who Diana Ross is. But if you think about Rihanna today, Diana Ross was her times three. Okay? He was the bodyguard for Diana Ross for 20 years. This guy was so good with his hands. Did he learn to use a gun? Yes. Did he learn to drive a car uh, in a, uh, combat, um, in a uh, security type of manner, driving in reverse, things of that nature? Of course, to be a professional bodyguard, you generally have to do those things. But he was offered that job based on the, his hardcore karate. Now, how big was, was he at the time when he took on the job of being Diana Ross's bodyguard? He was everything 5'10", 165 pounds. He was 5'10". 165 pounds, 20 years. He was a bodyguard of one of the original music divas of R&B, all right, Diana Ross. So my whole paradigm comes from karate being one of the most devastating martial arts that you could ever train or train in. The problem then came, the problem came when it had to be watered down. It had to be watered down by many instructors who probably didn't even know the real karate. Perhaps they were taught by people who had it watered down. But there is a reason why most of the masters, most of the true masters, settled in impoverished areas, like the areas where I used to train. There's a reason why they settled in impoverished areas. And if they didn't settle in totally impoverished areas, they settled in very, very big cities where a large percentage of those people were minorities and some poor whites. All right. Reason is because those particular people were going to their martial arts school wanting to learn the original karate. Why? Because they wanted to defend themselves. Only when karate started to be taken out into the suburbs, be taken out amongst the wealthy, not all wealthy people were lazy. Not all wealthy people are soft. There are people like B.J. Penn who's, who did not have to fight in mixed martial arts. His family was wealthy. Um, here's a man who asked, B.J. Penn was asked, what do you want to do with your life? He said, I want to be a world champion Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, uh, player. Right? So his family sent him out to California, paid the graces. I mean, the guy, the guy comes for money, B.J. Penn. So I'm not saying everybody who is rich or born into a wealthy family is lazy and is not tough. But what I'm saying generally, the lifestyle made it necessary to, if someone made it necessary for someone who opened a school in the better areas, in the better off areas, to water down their karate. Hence, you have people talking about karate isn't this. Karate isn't that. Well, you're never going to know what karate is unless you train with someone who trained in real karate like myself. The bottom line is that is my paradigm. And every single thing that I do, whether it's a stance that I take in boxing when I'm going to slug or hit hard, whether it's a stance I take in kickboxing if I'm going to slug or, or trying, to, trying to do some damage, or whether I get in a wrestling technique or wrestling stance and I'm getting ready to shoot for my takedown, Everything that I do comes from the mentality of old school karate and the philosophy of Ichigeki Hizatsu. Suicide attack in English, but actually attacking, what it actually means is attacking with conviction without any second guessing or any thought of what your opponent may do in return. Alright? So, that's why karate is my paradigm. And hopefully now you understand. Uma fight camp, save calm, and train hard, train smart. See you next video.